Man, how many of you be glad to be at church this morning? Say amen. Yeah, man, it's a beautiful fall day. How many of you would have rather stayed with a blanket and a book or football and a blanket or a fire and marshmallows and hot stuff to drink? Just you guys, huh? Everybody else wanted to be at church, Susan. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I, I know, I know. I appreciate y'all being here. So glad. It, man, it was, yesterday was that kind of day, too. I thought, I don't want to do anything. I just want to be at home. It's one of the, I, this, I love this time of season. I am a spring first. Spring is, spring is my jam, man. Fresh grass. It always reminds me of baseball fields. I use a leather journal on Sunday morning because it smells like a baseball glove. And so I, ah, that's how I get ready. All right, just so y'all know. Um, but, but I love fall. I love, I love when things start to cool off. I love when, when that season begins to hit. You can almost sense people, one of two things. You're either one of those crazy people that like is one. I'm just going to say this. If you're one of those holiday people, like I love holidays. I'm all about it. All right. I pray that your children this week eat more candy than what's physically possible for them. <laughs> And I pray you get the leftover good stuff. You know what I'm talking about. Those Reese cups. That house that gives the full-size candy bar. I hope, I hope those stay in your bag, parents. Okay? And Thanksgiving, I'm a fan. It's my jam. I love to eat. It's the beginning of eating season as the weather changes. And uh, Christmas, I'm good. I'm just not a fan of everything starting the moment July ends. Okay? Hobby Lobby, I blame you, all right? And so I, I appreciate just enjoying the fact that it's fall. I don't, I don't need something coming. And, and so I pray that you're enjoying just looking around and seeing things change. Uh, if, you, if, you want, if you struggle with this, find a six-year-old and put him in the back seat of your car. Brinley is, has been noticing over the last couple of weeks as we've been driving, and she'll holler at me, Dad! Which is always super super relaxing when you're driving. <laughs> and I'll go, what, what? The trees are changing. And then I stop for a second and I look at all the trees changing. And I'm like, yeah, they are, kid. We got one in our front yard that turns this bright red. And, and it literally did it in a day's time. It was like we went to bed and the next day this thing was just on fire the next morning. And she walked out of the, outside the front door on our way to school. And she walked out and was, <gasps> And I was like, man, I need some of that, right? And so I pray that you're taking the time and just enjoying what God is doing in these different seasons. I pray that you recognize the greater principle is that God works in seasons. Because things season out and they change. And so whatever season in your life you're in, maybe, maybe this season hasn't been a great one. And you're just looking for some kind of hope. Know that our God is a God of seasons. And that this one in, that you're in will come to an end, and there is one beyond it. And so, so I pray that's encouragement to you. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to be diving into the discipline this morning. First of all, last week, Aaron, Pastor Aaron killed it. That was an amazing sermon that he preached last week. If you had, didn't get a chance to hear that, I challenge you, go back and listen to it. You need silence and solitude in your life. Some of you are like, I'm actually trying to get out of solitude, Vince. I'm so lonely and I want people around me. That is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about designated intentional moments where you separate from the world and you focus on Christ. Set your phone down. Don't turn on the worship music. Just you, Jesus, and oxygen is all you need. I also have found this week, as people were convicted last week, that they told me that this is by far, in our current culture, one of the hardest disciplines to add into their life. We are not good at being still. We're not good at being still and focusing on Christ. Now, we might read a good book, or we might listen to music, or we might have, but no, no, no. I'm not talking about doing anything while you're silent. And in solitude, I'm talking about just resting in Christ alone. You'll be amazed how hard this is. It's the reason it's a discipline. You've got to work at it. You've got you to put some effort in. It is not easy. 
But as I was studying Aaron's sermon last week and I was listening to it and told him, man, by far, one of the best sermons he's preached. He just did a great job with it. And, but it challenged me. And so I, I started studying after he preached and I was like, man, I'm, I want to dig into this because there's some really interesting stuff about when Jesus goes into this, these moments of solitude, these moments of silence and solitude. We know he went alone into the wilderness to be tempted for 40 days. And, and that was in a pretty intense silence and solitude moment. But it definitely wasn't the last time we saw Jesus do this. He, he continues to move into these moments where he separates from people and tells the disciples, y'all stay here, I'm going to go over here. And he, he gets alone with the Father and, and spends time with him. And, and so I started noticing patterns. How many of you know we're all creatures of pattern? How many of you, let me just ask you a question. How many of you are not morning people? Hands up. All right. 10 o'clock is usually a mix. The 1130 service, they're like, it's 1130, Pastor Vince. And we're here. But it's a good mix. So a lot of you that are not morning people, let me ask you a question. Are you not a morning person or your pattern from the night before puts you in a position to not be a morning person? Like you're drinking caffeine all the way up until you pass out. You're not really got a routine going to bed. It's just whenever you fall asleep on the couch or whatever version of The Bachelor that you're watching is on. <laughs> you pick the show, I mean, and, and you just kind of drift off into it. Sometimes our patterns end up making us what we will say. Well, I'm just not a morning person. No, you're not a night before person. I used to tell people like when I was in school, I used to always look back at my school days and go, well, you know, the reality is just I'm not, I'm not really good at tests. And what I really meant was I was not good at taking notes. There was a pattern in my life that led me up to where I wasn't prepared for the test. And so in, I used to just cop out and go, I don't test well. No, I didn't take notes well. That's why I didn't test well. There was a pattern before the moment. And I think in the Bible, when we begin to look at these patterns and you begin to look at the disciplines that we've been studying through, you realize that as you add these disciplines, they will in turn create patterns in your life. And so we see when Jesus has this pattern, and he has this pattern where literally Jesus disappears into the wilderness, 40 days, tempted by Satan, comes out. He does it again later in the New Testament, or later in the Gospels. There's moments where he feeds 5,000 people, tells the disciples, hey, you guys take off, go on, go on, I'll, I'll meet with you. And he goes up to the mountain to pray. We see the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus goes up into the mountain. Peter and John go with him. He goes a little further, has this moment with God. And then, and then even, in the, even in the garden, you notice in the garden, it, just before he's crucified, Jesus takes the disciples into the garden, tells Peter, James, and John, y'all stay here and going a little bit further. Jesus separated from them solitude, him and the father, even in his prayer, father, not my will be done, but thy will be done. So we see this pattern in Jesus's life over and over and over in the gospels. You say, well, yeah, there's, there's a pattern. He, he gets separate. He, he gets separate. He, he isolates. See, silence and solitude, that's a really powerful thing. But I want you to see that the pattern creates an effect every time. Every time. And the pattern in Jesus' life of time with the Father produced an effect of action and service. cannot spend time with the Father and not move into action and service afterwards. We don't see it. You, you, you can't find it. I, I looked this week. I'm like, maybe, maybe I just find a place where Jesus has this incredible moment with the Father and then comes out and he's like, I'm good. And just takes a nap. He doesn't. Nope. After time with the Father, action and service follow. 
So as I was studying that, I'm reading this, and I'm thinking, man, that's pretty impressive. I like that. I, as a pastor, man, I really like that. And so then I started thinking, as believers, if we focus our time spending time with the Father, like Aaron preached last week, if we're going to actually take some time and spend time with the Father and get face-to-face -face with Jesus and spend our time in worship and prayer and digging into his word and having these moments where it's just us and God, Is the same effect produced in my life and in your life? See, the discipline today is service. Service. I've heard preachers say these phrases about Jesus. We're, we're never more like Jesus than when we give. We're never more like Jesus than when we serve. We're never more like Jesus. You can go on and on and on. And I agree with those statements. But I think more powerful is the pattern that in being with Jesus, it creates the effect of action and serving. But I also think we can fall into the trap of if we're close to Jesus, then I don't know that we have to have the effect. And sometimes we get fooled into thinking that being close to Jesus is being with him. And it's not the same. It's not the same. And so the effect wouldn't be the same. I think through this as I, as I begin studying this and, and going, okay, so God, I really want to preach this, but it could really come across pretty harsh. It could really, <coughs> in fact, I was pretty rough on the 830 service. Y'all should pray for them. I, really, it, it, was, it was messy. And, and I went to Aaron and I said, I Reed, you were in there. I, I told Aaron, I said, I think I come across maybe a little mad. And I don't, I didn't, that wasn't my heart. It's definitely not my heart. But the reality is, as I look at our world and I watch the Christian church and I see it across and I have pastors calling me all the time and, and I go, Hey, what's the biggest, what's the biggest thing you're struggling with right now? What's the biggest thing you're struggling with right now? What's the thing in your church that you're struggling with right now? And without fail, top two things that one of the top two things that I get hit every time I talk to a pastor is I can't, I can't seem to get people plugged in to serving. And then I study this and I go, if the effect of spending time with the Father is action and service, and yet all of these pastors that keep talking with me, and if I'm just, I'll shoot straight with you, it would be one of the top two things that I would mention if they called me and asked me. If if the pattern is spending time with God and the effect of that pattern is action and service, either we're not spending enough time with God because I don't know that I'm seeing a lot of compelled people go, how can I serve? How can I serve? Or we just fooled ourselves into thinking being close is the same thing as being with. I, I won't apologize for this sermon, but what I'll say is that me and God have wrestled with this dude this week. We have fought about it. And you're like, why would you fight with God? Well, because I'm not perfect. That's why. And some things are not easy to preach. Some things I, I really want to be able to say. Some things I'm like, okay, Lord, in your boldness, I'm just going to rip the hide off of them. And then I read that scripture that says truth and grace. Okay, so I'll back off ripping the hide off anyone. So what does this look like then, Lord? And he said, show them the pattern. Show them what I did. And then tell them what Paul said. Tell them what Paul said to the church because he spoke this to a local church body in the book of Corinthians. He's talking to a local church that had ups and downs and it was an interesting group. That church at Corinth, interesting group. They were a little jacked up. How many of you have ever been part of a local church body that was a little jacked up? If you haven't, I want you to turn and look to your left. Look to your right. 
Welcome to a church body that's a little jacked up. We're not get, we're, we don't get it all right by any stretch. How many of you still struggle with sin? Okay, there you go. Paul was dealing with a church here, this church at Corinth, this local church body that was still dealing with sin and still trying to figure out how to be the church and, and still walk this out and know that it takes people to make ministry happen. So glad the team I got. So glad the people that I have surrounding me. I mean, we have, I have people right now on our staff with Pastor Aaron and Kim and Logan and Kirby and Jennifer. I think we have six full-time people on our staff, six, which we're blessed. We're super blessed. Then I, this last week, or it's been a couple of months back, a pastor called me and said, hey, I need to know what your ratio is. And I said, what do you mean my ratio? He said, your ratio of full-time employees to attendance. And I'm like, uh, I don't know. He's like, well, you know you can't do this in a healthy way unless you're about 1 to 90 or 1 to 110, somewhere in that window. One full-time staff member to 110 people. I'm like, oh, yeah, we're great. And then I started doing the math. And our ratio here at Real Life, because we are blessed, is one full-time staff member to 167 attendees. We're blessed, but let me be honest, that team is tired. They're wore out. I was joking with, the, I said, I, I threw Aaron under the bus in the first service. Actually, I said all this stuff and then kind of threw myself under the bus. <laughs> but Pastor Aaron is what we, we call him, our location pastor here at the church. And so Aaron is over all the Sunday ministries that happen. So on Sunday, we have worship that happens, children's that happen, host team that happens. And Aaron is the report for all of those ministries. Speaking to Aaron, he speaks into them. Plus, he's my secondary communicator. Plus, he handles all the student ministry. Anything the youth sixth through eighth grade or sixth through twelfth grade happens through Aaron. So Aaron is actually responsible for all the children's ministry from birth to fifth grade, and then all the student ministry sixth through twelfth grade. Plus, all the ministries that make you happy on Sunday morning, like getting really cool jackets or T-shirts or coffee or anything like that. And they're like, "Man, Aaron does all that." And I'm like, "Yeah." And they're like, "What do you do?" It's a good question. I'm over Aaron and some other people. <laughs> but it's a lot. And I watch him and he's, he just pours his heart into this church. And not only him, but the rest of our team does too. Just pour their heart into the church. And I just step back and I go, okay, Lord, I think you've called, I know you've called us here and I know this is the ministry, but, but there's something that needs to happen just in the Christian mind that says okay, God, I've spent time with you and out of this time with you, I need to do something. I, 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 need, to, I, need, to, I need to put my hands to the plow. I, I need to do something. You see this over and over and over and over in scripture, over and over and over in scripture. We see it. We see this state. Man, no man that puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. So there's something about putting your hand to the plow. You get, there's work to be done. There are people to be reached. There is a ministry. There is a kingdom to grow. And I go, all right, God, but, but do we get it or have we grown comfortable being close not with. And so we've fooled ourselves into saying a little bit of worship music here, a little bit of preaching here and there, and I'm golden. Let's look at what Paul says. Paul walks into this through Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to read quite a few verses and then we're going to come back and kind of walk through some of it. Here's how Paul walks it out. Verse, starting with verse 12 of chapter 12. For just as the body is one, but has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body. So it is with Christ for in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jew or Greek slave or free. And we're all made to drink of one spirit. Verse 14 for the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. That would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body. That would not make it any less part of the body. Verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, 
where would our sense of hearing be? And if the whole body were an ear, how would we smell? But as it is, God, catch this, God arranged. So you're not here by accident. You didn't walk through those doors by chance. God arranged. Your gifts were put in this box to be utilized for the killed kingdom building that this box does, that this church does. God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chooses. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is written, there are many parts, one body. How many of you thankful we're different? Say amen. amen. How many of you think, how many of you wish you could sing like some of the people up here? Here's the deal. I'm going to tell you straight up. If I could sing like some of the people up here sing, I would never preach another sermon. I'd just sing everything. Every hour, I'd be like, I like a cheeseburger. <laughs> I'm, I'm not even lying. I know myself well enough. Give me the five W twenty weight and my oil change. I'd, I'd just be that's why I'd be useless. My wife would drive out. She would have left me a long time ago because I'd just sang to her all the time. Do you want me to take out the trash? She'd be like, just. <laughs> There's a reason God didn't give me that and gave me this because this is what I do. There's a reason God gave you something and not something else. My question is, are you doing anything? Is there been an action after God gave his son to you? Has there been action with what you've been given? Or is close enough? I mean, I, I feel like God, me and God are close. It's odd, because that's not how salvation is ever mentioned in Scripture. Salvation is always quantified as with. Jesus even said it about the Holy Spirit. Although I am, I am with you, this Holy Spirit that's coming, it's going to be so much better because Kyle, he's going to be in you. In you. And so it's, it's, hard, it's hard to be in and not have an effect. And so we see Paul continue this letter. He goes out. But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chooses. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is written, there are many parts, yet one. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greatest honor. And our unpresentable parts are even treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. We may have the same care for one another. Look. I have a left hand and I have a right hand. But I'm not going to choose one if you ask me which one to cut off. Because I'm pretty fond of both my left hand and my right hand. Is one stronger? Yep. More dominant? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm left-handed and I am full-on left-handed. I've never been able to use a pair of scissors in my life in America. Three ring binders are of the devil, okay, for left-handed people. And so I, I, I well, then you, you, no, I like them both. I can't clap. You know, that'd be hard. I want to clap. I like them both. And that's what the scripture says. There's not one that we look at and go, well, this is greater. No, I like them both. I appreciate having what God has given me and what God, and that's how the body is supposed to be. All of us involved making the body work and function. So now, verse 27, now you are the body of Christ and individually 
members of it. Three things real quick. First thing, every person, every soul matters to God. Okay. I mean, lost souls, saved souls, but in the body, let's just talk about the body. All of you, Pastor Vince, I just don't know if it matter if I was gone. I don't know that you know or realize how much you're missed not being involved. I don't know that you realize how much you miss not being involved. I think I can state this very plainly and say this without any kind of uh, uh, doubt and say that every person that volunteers or serves at Real Life Church would be happy to have another body standing next to them serving. Because right now we just hit a, we're at a lid. We're at a lid. We, we're not able to do some things as we look around and go, Man, that would be great. We would love to do that. We would love to impact our community that way. We would love to figure out a way to add this to our church. We'd love to add this ministry here or there. But what people typically do is they go, man, if you guys will start that, we'll pray for you. And as much as I love your prayer, I need your hands and feet. Christians, I'm just shooting straight with you. I need your hands and feet. Some of you are capable and we've just got in this routine, this ease, and said, well, I don't know if my, my health matters. It matters. This couple of ladies on Thursday, Miss Pat, Miss Mary, Miss Janice. Are you all in this service? I'm looking around. No, I think, they, they all, I think they're all 830 people, which makes me feel bad for ripping them so bad. <laughs> Every Thursday they show up. I get here, and I think it's Miss Pat, Maybe uh, um, walks out of the bathrooms with our cleaning cart every Thursday. I say, hey, how are you this morning? I'm blessed. I'm like, she just walked, walked out of the men's bathroom <laughs> after a week here at Real Life Church. She defines blessed different than I do. <laughs> right? And man, she did. And I walk in this room and I don't know if you know, but this, this about 15,000 square feet right here from that wall to what's behind that wall. And I got two ladies that walk around this building all morning on Thursday. And they come back here and she'll holler at me down the steps. Pastor Vince, you want me to throw away your chicken from lunch yesterday? Because my office is in the back. And I'm like, oh, no. I feel bad, and she laughs, and she serves, and she vacuums, and she cleans, and she serves, and she laughs, and she joy, unspeakable and full of glory. As they just pour out, pour, and now there's a list of many others. I don't have the whole list of names that, that come in and serve throughout the week. All of our office volunteers that serve, to give time, people that serve in kids, I, I can't thank you enough. And I promise you, 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 don't, you may not even know them to know who to thank. But what I will tell you is to accomplish the vision that I believe God has called us to accomplish, it's not enough. It's not enough. <coughs> Pastor Vince is going to... I, I, please hear my heart in this. This is why I wrestled with this because I, I don't want a sermon on the discipline of serving to be a guilt trip and you go sign up for a week and then be tired of it and roll out. Don't do, don't do that. What I'm asking is, is I'm asking the simple question is if the effect of the pattern of time with God is service and action, Can you put a description on the service in action? I used to do this. Let me just, I'll, get, I'll give you my example. Well, I serve the Lord by preaching. That's my service to the Lord. It's preaching. And God said, no, it isn't. I'm like, Whoosh. I've been doing this 24 years, Lord. Y'all ever try to ex to God something. So I'm like, I've been, I've been doing this 24 years, God. This is what I do is I, I serve you by proclaiming your name. He said, Vince, you were talking long before I ever called you. You'd talk if I hadn't called you. 
yeah. He said, That's not, you're not sacrificing anything. You love this. You love that. Like, you love that. I'm like, I do love it. But like, no, no, Vince, I need you to serve. I need you to sacrifice. I need you to invest in some people and invest in some. I want you to serve. I want there to be action behind my time with you. And, he, and he's convicted me of it. I prayed several years ago. I'm like, God, I need you. I need you to bring people to the church that are called to ministry. All this time, he had been already bringing people to the church that were called to ministry. And all that time, I wasn't stepping into the service that he had asked me to step into because I was claiming something that was easy as my service. So now, now God's going to do some good stuff at the church. I've been praying, God, send us some people that are called. Send me some guys that want to preach. Send me some guys that feel called to ministry. Tim, stand up. Reed, stand up. Joe, stand up. And there's others that are walking through it right now. Just on, They are just on the edge of going, I don't know what it is, but God won't leave me alone. And I'm like, okay. And I'm going to tell you, some of these guys have been through a journey with me. They were with me while I was claiming that my service was preaching and missing out on the joy of serving them as a mentor and a friend. Now, now they got homework. Now they got to preach when they're not really sure if they know how. And I make them do it in front of the entire staff. And then we talk about it right in front of them. Super comfortable, isn't it, Joe? Love it. You live boy. <laughs> but listen, the moment I stepped into serving, God said, look how I've already been answering this. You just were close, not with, and you were missing it. You guys give it up for these guys that are stepping into this. Every soul matters. You say, Pastor Vince, I don't know that I matter. Listen to this. You are an invaluable part of the body of Christ invaluable part. Nobody knows who I am. Let me just tell you a few people in the Bible that felt the same way. One was named David. One was named Gideon. Gideon's phrase was, I, was, I am least among my father's house. David wasn't even invited to the party to be anointed as king. Uh, Jesse, do you have any other sons? Uh, you know, now that you mention it. Yeah, I got one more. Have you ever forgot how many sons you have? Jesse did, had a brain lapse, just forgot all, oh yeah, yeah, I, I forgot that one. Let me get David in here. He was the king, forgotten, didn't even get invited to the table. Just because you're not visible, just because this isn't the place. If you all had any idea how many pieces take place before this could ever happen. Just because you're not visible doesn't mean you're not valuable. In fact, the most valuable parts of my body are the ones you cannot see. The heart, lungs, rest that stuff in there, it's pretty vital. I'm not a doctor, I'm a preacher, okay? <laughs> but I, 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 I don't want you stepping in and thinking, well, what am I chasing? Nothing we're serving. God, I pour out me in use for you. Whatever it is, oh God, whatever it is. Lord, I want to spend time with you. And out of that time with you, call me to action. Call me to get involved. Call me to step in a gap. Call me to give 30 minutes before church. Call me to give 30 minutes after church. Call me to come in on a Tuesday afternoon or a Thursday morning. Or whenever it is, believe me, there is a place for you to serve. But if you're good being close, you'll tend to defer and allow someone else to do it. You'll tend to, ah, you know, I'm just, I'm so busy. As I studied the Gospels and I studied the New Testament, 
Because Aaron convicted me last week about this whole silence and solitude thing. As I got into digging through it, I began to look. I landed on this third point, and it's heavy. It, it, it is not something that I say lightly because some of you, some of you are just going to have to be convicted about it. Every saved soul should serve. I can't find a person in the Bible that didn't. I I can't find any named person in Scripture, especially the New Testament once the church started. I can't find anybody that wasn't like, I'll go. What, Barnabas, no, you're here? Silas, you want to go? Yeah, I'll go. Barnabas, I'm I'm not going to quit. I'm just getting Mark to go over here so we can go do something different. Mark needs some help. He needs somebody to walk with him. I'm going to walk with him. Say, well, what does that mean? I don't know. I don't know what it means for you. And please hear me. This is not me going, go sign up for children's ministry. Frankly, some of y'all don't need to be in children's ministry. Hold on, before you say amen, it's not because you're not capable, it's because you have a grumpy face. You guys, how many of you know, just some people have grumpy faces? They don't mean it, they just have one of those faces. Imagine, welcome to Children's Church. That's gonna be, that's not a good vibe. (laughs) It's not what we're seeking. Would you like some water? (laughs) Nope. No, I'm not. And I don't, want you, I don't want you to serve somewhere where it doesn't fit. But some of you have walked through the process of finding the fit. And went, well, well, you know, I'm not, it's so busy right now. Okay. I don't know how to preach through that one. Oh, I, I do. But the Lord won't let me. Every saved soul should serve the kingdom. I wrote this down this morning. I I woke up this morning and was sitting down with my notes. It says the vision of real life, church, is a big vision. For whatever reason, God called me back home to plant a church where people could find Jesus and families would be made whole and strong that men and women would find the real savior and he would radically change their lives. Everyone we have serving would gladly take someone serving by their side. And I wonder what could we change? What could we change in the community? What, What bondage would be broken What resources would the church have if instead of starting with, well, I I don't, uh, we just went, yeah, maybe. Maybe, let me see what's available. Let me see if I can, let me see if I can figure out a way to make this work. What if we just gave serving the benefit of the doubt that it might be a blessing and not a weight? I know, I know. Churches wear us out. Look, we do two things a week. Sunday morning and either groups or next track. That's what we ask. So I get it. The world is begging for your time and your attention. That's why we're try, we try to be really mindful of it and go, no, we're not doing Sunday morning. We're not doing Sunday. We're not doing Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night and life groups and this and no, I'm not going to wear you out. But I wonder if you would just stop and go, Lord, spend time with God, with God. And go, Lord, what would you have me do? See what his response is. Before you answer, see what his response is. And I'll never fault you for that. If you spent time in the, with the Lord, you spent time in prayer. I'm not going to sweat you. I'm not going to sweat you either way. 
I'm not calling you. I'm not beating your door down. It's not who I am. It's not what I do. But I think if you start spending time with the Father, you start accessing the spirit that is within you. Action and service will be what comes out of you. Each week, I'll say, hey, real life, be the hands and feet of Jesus. We'll see you next Sunday. And we hear it and go on. Feet deliver the good news. Hands offer help to those without. And words bring hope to the hurting. You, you, you are the body of Christ. You, you are the hands and feet of the kingdom of the almighty God. The hope that is within us is the only hope that changes a broken world. Just be the hands and feet. Find a place to serve. Find a place to live out this faith. Find a place to hear the voice of God and respond the way he asks you to. Bow with me, church. No one looking around. I'm not doing an invitation forward, but I am going to challenge you today. I know the routine. You walk out the door, you turn left, head to that parking lot, roll out. I'm going to challenge you today. I'm going to ask you to do something. What if today, instead of walking out those black doors and turning left, you walked out the doors and turned right, and you walked into the Life Connect room said, what can I do? Where can I serve? How can I hold somebody up? How can I walk beside them in the ministry? How can I help grow the kingdom? What would happen if change that we've been talking about, this change that happens here, What if it truly, truly needs to start in your decision when you leave today? Father, I love you. Jesus, I thank you for your grace, for your mercy, and for your love. I thank you for, God, I thank you for stepping off that hillside when you told the disciples to go ahead. And after your time with the Lord, you served by walking on the water and saving Peter from drowning. God, I thank you that at that Mount of Transfiguration and you spent that time with the Lord and you come down the hill, you served by healing the boy with seizures. God, I thank you that in the Garden of Gethsemane, as you spent time alone with your father, You came down that hillside and you served by offering me eternity. Help us be a people that serve. Help us be a people that chase after you and help the effect of that pattern flow out in our lives. God, we thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.